a series of messages now on uh, prophecy and uh, in the next uh, several weeks here uh, and coming uh, starting with last Sunday night and tonight and the next uh, four or five Sunday nights here in a row I'm going to be preaching a series of messages on prophecy and tonight I'm going to preach uh, the next thing in prophecy, and that's uh, after Sunday night, last Sunday night, I preached on the rapture, and that's what's going to happen next in prophecy, and we don't know the exact date, but uh, very soon, Lord willing, I was talking to uh, Brother Ronnie Roach on the telephone this afternoon. And uh, he called me up, and we talked for about an hour and had a good time of fellowship and really encouraged my heart to talk with him. And uh, he was telling me about a fellow writing an article saying, Jesus Christ, come back in 1981. And, and he picked up that article, and he wrote a little note. Uh, you missed it, bud. <laughs> and that's all he put on there. That's all Ronnie put there. You missed it, bud. And he didn't put his return address, nothing. Put it in the mail and send it to him. <laughs> you missed it, bud. And send him the letter. 1981's already gone, so he missed it all right. But we, we believe the Lord is soon coming back and the rapture of the church and he's going to take all the Christians home to heaven. And then the next thing I want to preach on in prophecy, uh, you may write this down in your note somewhere. And uh, write this down in your Bible, and that is the judgment seat of Christ. Now, Christians should know in prophecy the judgment seat of Christ, uh, and it's good to know what's going to happen in the future so you can get prepared for it. You say, Brother Bemis, what good is it to know the prophecy and the things in prophecy that are going to happen is because you can get ready for them, so you can get prepared for them. And I think it's real good sense for you to get prepared for the rapture if you're going to go home to the uh, Lord Jesus Christ. And I think it's good sense to get prepared for the judgment seat of Christ if that's where you're headed. Now, if you're going to miss the rapture and going to miss the judgment seat of Christ, you better get prepared for the tribulation. Amen? Amen? Then the next thing for you to do is to go out here and get you a bunch of stores good and ready and get you a homemade meal where you make all your food and, and uh, don't have to buy nothing and make all your own electricity and uh, just get by where you don't have to depend upon nobody for nothing if you're going to go through the tribulation. I mean, head off to Timbuktu, get out in the world, and let the rest of the world go to hell and get all by yourself and get in the tribulation and don't have nothing to do with nobody and just maybe 
chances are you'll wind up in hell anyway because you rejected Jesus Christ. But just maybe nine times out of a million, uh, one time out of a million, I take that back. Yeah, maybe one out of a million, maybe something like that, maybe one out of a half a million, or make it through the tribulation without getting saved. I said, without getting saved, make it through the tribulation. Don't take the mark of the beast. Don't get killed by all the famine that goes on. Don't get, uh, don't get die and everything that takes place in the tribulation period. And by just some pure grit that you got, which about nine million people don't have, that you make it through the tribulation without Jesus Christ. You know what you'd end up doing? you would reject him in the millennium and still die and go to hell. That's what you do. Because you rejected him now. You reject him in the tribulation. You reject him in the million, in the millennium and still die without Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and end up in hell anyway. End up in hell anyway. All right, and I'll give you all the verses to prove that one of these days. <laughs> but tonight I have a preach on the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. Now, first of all, take your Bible, and you need to write these verses down because every Christian should uh, know them, and he should uh, know them because it helps him get prepared for the judgment seat of Christ. All right, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. This is one of the first major places, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. Now, uh, notice in verse 10 it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now I want you to notice the last statement on verse 10. Uh, of course, this is the judgment seat of Christ. That's the context, and that's the judgment for the saved people. That's the judgment for the Christians. Now that's not the judgment for the unsaved people. There will be no unsaved people at the judgment seat of Christ where the Christians are judged. No unsaved people are there. They are judged a thousand seven years later at the great white throne judgment. So don't confuse the judgment seat of Christ with the great white throne judgment. There are two different places at two different times with at least a thousand seven years between the two. So this is the judgment seat of Christ and notice it says in verse 10, whether it be good, that's the good things you've done, you have to give account for the good things you've done in your body. Amen? Amen. And then you have to give account also for the what? Whew, we, wow. Whew. Now most Christians, when they read the bad things, it bothers them to such an extent, they say, Brother Bemis, then why did Jesus Christ die on the cross of Calvary? He died to save you from hell. He died to pay for all your sins when he died on the cross of Calvary. He died for all your sins. Then you say, why do I have to give account of the bad things at the judgment seat of Christ if Jesus Christ paid for my sins at the cross of Calvary. When he died for your sins, he took care of the heaven and hell relationship for you. But that did not take care of your fellowship and your happiness with the Lord Jesus Christ. You still have to take care of that from day to day. From day to day. That's a matter of fellowship between you and God. He did not automatically wash away all your sins at the cross of Calvary the day you got saved. You have to confess your sins from day to day. You say, what if I don't confess them? Then you're out of fellowship. 
You lose fellowship. You don't lose salvation because that's taken care of at the cross of Calvary. That is already passed and over and gone. But you do lose your fellowship. And if you keep on sinning and do not confess that sin, you will lose more than your fellowship. You will lose your joy. You will lose your health. You will lose your rewards. You will lose your happiness. And you will lose your testimony. And you will even lose your life if you don't confess your sins. You won't lose your salvation. Because that is secure at the cross of Calvary. That's taken care of. That has no strings attached to it. But your joy, your fellowship, your rewards, and your happiness, and your assurance all have strings attached to them. Now I'm going pretty fast. I hope you are following me in what I'm saying. So when you go to the judgment seat of Christ, you have to give account of what you've done in the body. You have to give account of what you've done that was good, and you also have to give account of what was bad. Now I know that's very hard for you, but that's what the verse said. So when the judgment seat of Christ comes, you say, I've lived like the devil all my life. I've done it any old way I wanted to do it. You have not sinned and got away with it. You said, I did too. You got the judgment seat of Christ to face. Now, if those sins are under the blood of Jesus Christ, and they're put under the blood at the judgment seat of Christ, they will be cleansed and they will not be brought up, and God will not judge you. It's only the sins that are not dealt with. And it's only the sin that you have not faced and dealt with. Once you face it and deal with it, it's under the blood of Jesus Christ. It's forgiven and forgotten. And you will not face it at the judgment seat of Christ. It's the ones you don't deal with. And that may be a uh, many, that may be few, depending upon what kind of Christian you are. All right, now let's go on again. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and let's pick up another verse on the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, before you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, let's get 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and pick up verse 5, and let's find out the time of the judgment seat of Christ. When does the time of the judgment seat of Christ take place? When is the very time? All right, 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. This is the time of the, second, the judgment seat of Christ. Therefore, judge nothing before the time, the time, the time, until the Lord come, who shall bring uh, both, who will both, will, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsel of the heart, and then shall every man have praise of God. Notice he says, until the Lord come. That's when the judgment seat of Christ is going to occur. The judgment seat of Christ will start the minute after the rapture. The minute that every Christian is raptured off this earth and is taken up to the uh, cloud in the sky and back into the third heaven with the Lord himself, then the judgment seat of Christ will begin. And that judgment seat of Christ will be every single moment of your Christian life. From the day that you got saved. From the minute that you got saved. From the second that you got saved. Till the day that you went home to heaven to be with Jesus Christ. That's what you will give account of. All right. Now, uh, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, let's start reading tonight in verse 9. Let's begin at verse 9. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. There we go. Uh, before I get that verse, I want to say one more thing. The judgment seat of Christ is not going to be a matter of whether you're saved or whether you're lost. 
God's not going to take you to the judgment and take you up and put you on a scale and bounce you out and put your good works over here and your bad works out here and say, well, if my good works outweigh my bad works, then I'll go to heaven. And if my good works uh, don't outweigh my bad works, uh, then I'm in trouble. Well, that's not the case. You're not going to uh, judge a matter according to your works as far as heaven and hell is concerned. That was taken place at the cross of Calvary. Your judgment of heaven and hell is already over. When Christ died for you, your sins were already all paid for. The sins that you... Look at here. When Jesus died on the cross, where were you? You wasn't even born. Where were your sins when Jesus died on the cross at Calvary? You hadn't committed them yet. Did Jesus die for your sins that you hadn't even committed yet? Did he die for the sins that were before you got saved? Did he also die for your sins that after you got saved? Were they all future? Somebody said, but Brother Bemis, he died just for my sins up to the moment that I got saved. No way. He died for this, all your sins. That is a matter of heaven and hell taking place at the cross of Calvary. That's over with. But that is in relationship of heaven and hell. That's not in relationship of your rewards. That's not in relationship of what you can receive. That's not in relationship to what God is going to give you. That's not in relationship to your shame. Those are different matters. All right. Again, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 now, and let's pick up verse 9. Do you know when I read this here, now not read it, but the first time I've ever heard the judgment seat of Christ, I left the Methodist church and become a Baptist. When I learned what the judgment seat of Christ really meant, I got out of the Methodist church and I was a sprinkled Methodist, by the way. And I left them that night in my heart. I got out of the Methodist church and joined the Baptist church. You know why? Because it proved to me the eternal security of the believer. For the first time, I realized that you can be saved, still sin, and still go to heaven. And then I, understand, I understood why. Understand it. <laughs> Understood why? All right. Now let's get it. First Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to stick with it this time. Verse 9. For we are labors together. In verse 9. Labors together. Now that means I'm laboring, and that means God's laboring. With God, I'm laboring and he's laboring. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. And now he says, ye. Then all Christians, he's likening to them as a husbandry, like a vineyard. And he's likening to them as a building. Then every Christian here is God's building. You are. You're God's building. You're God's building, and you're God's building, and you're God's building. And you are, 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 and you are. You're God's building. And God's building you, and you're building yourself. And God likens to you like that. It's like this. A guy goes out and he puts down a foundation. And he puts down the footings, and he puts down the concrete slab, and he puts some steel bars in it, and then he makes it smooth on top. And then he said, there's the foundation. You build on the foundation. And he likens to that as you getting saved, building the foundation. That's you being born again. You getting saved and coming to know Jesus. That's the foundation. I laid it when I led you to the Lord. If I led you to the Lord. If somebody else laid it when they led you to the Lord. But now it's up to you what kind of house you build upon that foundation. That is up to you. Now you say, well, Brother Bemis, I didn't see all that. All right, now let's read the next verse. The next verse in verse 10. 
according to the grace of God, according to God's grace, which is given unto me, given unto Paul, as a wise master builder, underline that word, a wise master builder, then he's the chief carpenter. He's the carpenter. He's the one that got you saved. I have laid the foundation. Paul led you to the Lord. And another build thereupon. But let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. Verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now look at that in verse uh, 11. For other foundation can no man lay than is th that is laid, which is Jesus Christ then the only way to get saved and the only foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. You must receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can't Buddha. You can't build it on Buddha. Buddha is no foundation. You can't build it on Confucius. Confucius is no foundation. You can't build it on the Pope. That's right. <laughs> He's no foundation. <laughs> you can't build it on the preacher. He's no foundation. Amen? What do you got to build it on? There is only one. Who is it? Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. Then he's the way for you to get saved. He's the foundation. Now go back and read verse 10 again. According to the grace of God which given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, Paul led him to the Lord, and another built thereupon. They built a house. But... Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Then the Christian is to take heed what kind of Christian life he has after he gets saved. He becomes a child of God by laying the foundation. Yeah, everybody gets saved in different places at different times under different circumstances. It's all through the Lord Jesus Christ saving them. Amen? But then they're to take heed of that. You know what the word take heed means? That means uh, be very careful. That means uh, watch out. That means uh, wise up. <laughs> that means uh, do something about it. That means don't take it with a grain of salt. How many understand what I'm saying? Amen? Okay. All right. Uh, verse 12 now. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, every man's work should be made manifest. Now there's six materials there. Now, there's six houses that a man can build, six different types of houses that he can put on that foundation. But if you divide those houses up, there's basically three of them are one type of work and three are another type of work. Underline the word work in verse 13. Every man's work. Then what it is is you get saved and then your works for Jesus Christ is the type of house you have. If your works are good and perfect and pure and lots of them and with the right heart motive and with the right desire, then that is a house of gold. But if your works are the wrong kind of works and you got saved all right, but that's a house of hate. Now let me give you an illustration. I want you to notice right there in verse 13 it says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work, underline that right there, of what sort it is. Of what sort it is. Then it is quality and not quantity. The heart motive the heart motive in the relationship to God is absolute in the service toward God. Now you can have your heart right and your outside be wrong. 
and God will still make you give account of it. Don't you say, well, my heart's right, and so I'm right with God. You may be deceived by the devil because your outside's got to be right too. Because if the inside is right like it ought to be, there's going to be some outside right too. The fellow says, I'm right in my heart. Then uh, how come some other things ain't right? Hmm? Hmm? Tell me that one. You say, I'm right in my heart. Don't you tell me you're right in your heart. You might tell God you're right in your heart. And you might tell the devil you're right in your heart. But you ain't going to tell me you're right. How do you figure that? Man, that's too much for me. <laughs> Just plain and simple. When you get that heart in 100% right with God, then you're going to make sure that how you look and affect other people is going to start accounting to the way you are. Somebody said, I don't care how I affect other people. Don't give me that. You affect other people, and you have to give an account how you affect other people. Because the heart has to be right. See, there's, there's a little spot, little you know, it's like this. The heart has different areas in it. And you give God your heart here, and you give your God your heart there, and you give God your heart here, but this little spot here, this is for me. I'm saving this for myself. <laughs> Nobody, my wife don't know about it, my son don't know about it. And my husband don't know about it. Nobody else knows about it. This is for me. Your heart ain't right. Amen. All right. Now let me give you another illustration. It said of what sort it is. Then the heart motive is going to be the real judgment at the judgment seat of Christ. Now you can't always see the heart. You can, in fact, you can very seldom see the heart. Once in a while you can see it come out the mouth. Lots of times the mouth deceives it. Amen. The heart deceives the mouth, and the mouth deceives the heart. The Bible says the heart is desperately wicked, and who can know it? Amen? Amen. So sometimes you deceive your own heart. So what do you got to go by, brother? You got to go by the book. All right, let me give you an illustration. Here's one fellow. He's on the house of gold. Man, he gets saved. He's born again. He's God's child. Somebody leads him to the Lord. Man, he don't know John 3.16. He don't know Romans 3.23. He don't know nothing. But he's saved. Woo! I got saved yesterday. I accepted Jesus as my Savior. Now I'm going to quit smoking. I'm going to quit cussing. I'm going to quit doing all that bad stuff. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. I mean, he opens up his Bible and he starts reading. Man, he goes through the book and goes through the book and goes through the book. And then he goes through it again and goes through it again and goes through it again. Man, he goes out there and starts witnessing and winning souls to Jesus Christ. And he does everything he knows of. And the Lord says, I want you to be a missionary. He says, Lord, I'm ready. Here, take me. And he goes down to Africa somewhere. And he goes down there and wins 25 natives to the Lord. He went God's way, doing God's method, in the way that God wanted it to do. He's got a house of gold. Now here's another man way over on the other extreme. It's not gold, but it's what? Gold, silver, precious stones, hay, wood, and stubble. He's the stubble. He got saved. He's on the foundation. He accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Whoa, may I receive Jesus as my Savior. Woo! Is he saved? Amen. Did he get saved just like this fellow over here did? Sure, they both received Jesus Christ. But this fellow over here, he says, Well, don't be a fanatic about it. Oh, don't get too excited. His daddy or uncle or cousin, somebody said that to him. You know, he heard it somewhere else. The devil stuck it in his ear. He said, Well, yeah, I'm saved, but no sense in being a fanatic. I'll read my Bible. Of course, you've got to read your Bible. Reads his Bible to soothe his conscience, you know. Get through it, you know. Go to church with his wife, because his wife bugs him, and he's got to go, you know, got to soothe his conscience. It's right to go to church. I'm tired. Oh, yes, I'm tired. That's, every Christian ought to tithe. Sure, he tithe. 
He, but he never really gets with it, you know? Doesn't just, you know, just slides through. Doesn't do any more than he really has to do. You know that kind of guy? House of hay. House of hay. And let me give you an example again. Here's one body out in the street corner. And he sticks his hand up in the air and says, You're all going to hell. Repent from your sins and turn and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And in his heart he says, They're lost without Jesus. They're blind. They're dead in trespasses and sin. There's no hope for them. Only Jesus can save them. And the other fellow, he's out in the street corner. And he sticks his hand up in the air and says, Repent from your sins and turn to Jesus Christ and receive Him as your Lord and Savior. And in his heart, he said, Ah, that pretty beautiful girl, she'll see me and she'll just think I'm such a good-looking fella and I just sold out to the Lord. Ah, she'll just think I'm really something. <laughs> Repent, you sinner, you! Did they look a difference on the outside? He said the same thing. They had their hand cupped over their mouth. They had their hand up in the air the same. And it come across there and power was in both of their messages. They looked just alike. But one of them on this side had a different heart attitude. It's the heart, fella. Not the head. Not the head. The heart. You better get that thing right down in there. Don't worry about that. Get that right. That's 90% of your problem. Amen? I'll preach you a little bit down through here. <laughs> All right. Uh, I can't afford not to. Amen? Amen. So, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 now. And look at verse 12. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hair, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. Now underline that word manifest. Every man's work shall be made manifest. To manifest something is to bring it open and to clear Bring it out and reveal what it is. Manifest it. Now what that is, is this. Then God will take, and he'll reel up his TV screen and his IBM machine and his radio and his TV and his recorders and get all his recorders, and he'll take everything that you've said in your heart and in your mind and flash it across that TV screen. And then he's going to know, and so is everybody else going to know, the real you. The real you. I ought to name this message, the real you. <laughs> you said, Brother Bemis, that'd be scary. That's why it's an absolute must that you keep your heart right with God. And if it ain't right, get it right. Get down on your hands and knees and do some bawling and some crying and some praying and get your heart right with God. Because if you don't get it right now, you'll wish you had over there. Because then you give account. And then you say, oh, you say, so what, preacher, what difference did it make? Then the whole universe will know about it. Brother? The whole universe will know about it. You know what I do? I put every one of my sins under the blood of Jesus Christ because I don't want them to show up at the judgment seat of Christ. I don't want nobody to see them. Sure, man. Sure, hide them. Hide them under the blood. So when the judgment seat of Christ gives around, all they'll see is blood. The blood of Jesus Christ. Because they'll all be under the blood. If you put them under there. If you don't put them under there, they won't be under there. 
Now, some folks are going to be dangerous. You know, some Bible says every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account therefore in the day of judgment. Matthew chapter 12. Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account therefore in the day of judgment. You say that ought to scare you. Yes, it ought to scare you. Ought to scare you half to death. You say, I'm scared. Good. Do something about it. Put them under the blood. Put them under the blood. Every time one comes up, run to Jesus. Put it under the blood. Man, don't even wait till nighttime comes. Put it under the blood. You say, as I'm driving down the road, anywhere. Brother, everywhere. Put it under the blood. Then you won't forget it. You say, preacher, I might forget. Then ask God to remind you. And he'll remind you. And then put it under the blood. Again, every man's work abide which... No, verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day. That's the judgment day there. The judgment seat of Christ. For the day shall declare it. Because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now the fire comes along and the fire is going to test this man's work of gold. Here's his whole life up before him. He has a life of gold. He got saved and he built on that thing gold. It is not a matter of quantity, brother. It is quality. You say, prove that. The widow's might. The widow's might. Jesus was standing there, and it said the rich man came by and threw in of their plenty. And it said the poor widow woman come by and threw in two pence. And Jesus said she put more in than all of them. What is it? It's quality. Not quantity. Quality. And then the fire comes along and tries your works. If the works are from the right heart motive, then they go through the fire. What will fire do to gold? Nothing but purify it. The fire, the fire is how you purify gold. You burn out the, the straw. Dross, dross. You burn out the dross. Silver. Silver. The fire burns out the dross. Precious stones. It don't destroy him. But what does it do to hay, wood, and stubble? Bonfire. So, fellow, here's a guy that got a great big church. He has 900. He's running 900 every Sunday morning. 900. He gives away $500 worth of candy every Sunday. And he preaches out of the RSV. And he uh, recommends the Amplified. And he believes you just might lose your salvation if you don't endure to the end. <laughs> What has he done? He's built a house of hay. It's quality, brother. Quality. Not quantity. Not quantity. Now don't you take that and say, well, I'll just make it quality and sit back on my nothing and do nothing. You ain't got it, brother. The Bible says, bear fruit, bear fruit, bear fruit. John chapter 15 says, bear more fruit, much fruit, and much fruit. And if you don't bear any fruit, he said, take it away. Don't you just sit back and do nothing. You're in real trouble if you do. Did you know he said, take it away? How many of you know he said, take it away? But no fruit. Amen. All right. Now let's go on. Uh... Uh, verse uh, 16. No, verse 15. If any man's work, if any man's work should be burned, he shall suffer loss. Then there's the Christian. 
He got saved. He's on the salt of the rock. The fire comes down. Judgment seat of Christ. Down comes that fire. And his works go up in a pile of smoke. He's lost. What did he lose? Look at the verse. What did he lose? Right there at that verse, right in the middle of that verse, he shall suffer loss. I was sitting in a Baptist church in 19... forgot what it was. And about 800 people in that auditorium. And I come that close to jumping up and saying, Sinner, you can lose your salvation. I come that close to doing it. I really did. But a good thing I didn't. Because <laughs> he read the next verse before I had guts enough to stand up and say it. And it saved my neck because he completely changed me from a Methodist to a Baptist. When he read the next verse. The rest of that verse said, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Woo Eternal security of the believer. Amen. And I finally understood how a man can live wrong and not live right and be saved and sin and not get away with it and not get away with it I finally understood I finally had the answer once saved always saved but you can't sin and get away with it because you'll pay for it at the judgment seat of Christ it'll go up in a ball of flame I had a Christian one time tell me, well, bless God, I'm saved. So what if I have to pay for it to judgment seat of Christ? Well, you know, there's one verse that said naked before him and ashamed for those who didn't live right in Jesus Christ. Now you say, brother, explain that. I'll explain it. Here you are, the judgment seat of Christ. And on this side over here, there's about 9,000 angels playing harps. And over on this side, there's about 9,000 angels playing trumpets. And over on this side, there's about 10,000 more angels playing harmonicas. And there's about 900,000 over here playing a, a violin. And the music is just playing up. And they bang up. Playing up behind me. It just makes the hair stand up in the back of your neck. And then the Lord calls out your name and the whole universe is quiet, so quiet you could hear a pin drop. And out you step. And out you come. And it all comes out to light. And then lo and behold, you're standing there naked before the universe. You talk about a shame. But if you talk about a shame, that's going to be some folks. But then on the other hand, there's, 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 there's those some that same thing happens. I don't know if it'll be me. May not be. Probably won't. Just maybe. Wishful thinking. And the trumpets fly up, and all the bugles on that side, and all the trumpets, and all the clarinets, and, and the drums. And, no drums. And everything else over there, and up she goes. And then you can just hear that pin drop. Everybody just quiet as could be, the whole universe. And the Lord says, Step out, my son, and calls out a name. And out comes that saint of God and stands. And then the Lord says, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. And then takes a crown and puts it on your head. Woo! What a time. What a time. Say, preacher, you believe that? 
I believe it as much as I'm standing before you tonight and preaching to you to the best of my ability, I believe it. Now the question is, how are you going to fare? How are you going to fare? Now, read the last part. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Verse 16. Uh, verse uh, 14. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. I'll receive a reward. Now before that universe, not only does the Lord set one crown, maybe he'll set two. Maybe he'll set three. Maybe he'll set four. Just maybe he'll set five. I'm shooting for one. I'm shooting for one. You say you're shooting for one. I'm shooting for one. Anybody know which one of it? I hope I get love is appearing. I hope I get the soul winners. But uh, there's a whole lot of better soul winners than I am. And there's probably more that love is appearing better than I do. And I quite don't quite love it enough, I don't think. There you go. No, the Marty's crown. <laughs> That's not the one I'm shooting for. <laughs> I ought to be. <laughs> but if I was shooting for that one, I'd do a better job than I'm doing. <laughs> no, I'm shooting for the pastor's crown. And now qualifications of those are found. I'm just, I'm just going to read these for the fun of it. Turn to uh, 1 Peter. I'm just going to read this for my own benefit this evening. Uh, you, can, you can get in on us if you uh, very want to. It's free country. Uh, this is just for myself. First uh, Peter chapter 5 and verse 1 says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you. I hope I feed you. Taking the oversight thereof. I hope I do that. Not by constraint, not because I have to, but willingly, because I want to. Not for filthy lucre, I don't do it because of money, but of a, a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, Lord help me not to do that, but being examples to the flock, I am an example to you, I pray that you follow my example. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. You're going to get your one? You're going to get your crown. You're going to get the soul winner's crown, the martyr's crown, the love is appearing crown, the pastor's crown, or these. Which one did I miss? I missed one crown. What crown was it? It was, uh, uh, there, the crown, the, probably the hardest one to get, the incorruptible crown, those that keep under their body, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25 and 26. Now I'm going to finish this message up this evening. You ought to get prepared and ready. I believe within all my heart and mind and soul that everything you do that's done with the heart right motive and the results have to be considered, how it comes out has to be considered. The effect that you make has to be considered. Not just your heart motive in it, brother. That you will receive a reward at the judgment seat of Christ. Whether it's a crown or whatever it is, there will be the reward for faithful service. Faithful. Faithful! I will end with this verse. Uh, Luke chapter 19. And this gives you the final thing that I can think of this evening on the judgment seat of Christ. 
says in Luke chapter 19, verse 17 said, And he said unto him, Well, thy good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. Notice he said, Faithful in a very little. A very little. It's not how big the congregation is that counts. It's how faithful you are. It's not how big the Sunday school count. It's how faithful you are. It's not how big your work is. It's how faithful you are. It's not how many souls you win to Christ. It's how faithful you are in winning them. It's not how faithful, how many prayers you get answered. It's how faithful you are in praying. It's faithful, brother. Faithful. Don't quit. Don't quit. All eyes closed and all heads bowed and Christians pray this evening. Now I say this evening, I pray the word of God done something for your heart and done something for your life. And I pray this evening if there's any Christian here that is not really ready and your heart is not in the state that it should be in.